Welcome back, everyone. This is Mind Your Body. This is Ori Krug, and I am so excited to be back here today. Um, I know I haven't been super consistent, but I got this awesome email the other day telling me that my podcast was in the top 75 podcasts for mental health in the Netherlands and in New Zealand and some really other awesome rankings in several different countries. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's get it together, Arit, and let's do some more interviews. So if you are listening to this and you have something you wanna share and want to spread some wisdom or knowledge, please, please contact me. And there is a contact form on my website for this podcast mindyourbodydmt.com and contact me and we'll set up an interview if it's a good fit. Um, today we are interviewing Grace Bella Harmon about moving grief through the body and this was an excellent conversation about a topic I don't think that we talk enough about as a society so I love how real Grace kept it. I love how direct she was in being able to truly thrive actually from your grief, not just try to survive on it or push it away, but to truly thrive. So in a minute, I'm gonna share with you this interview. But before I do, I also want to let you know that I have just spent a good amount of time revamping my free Rewired for Love training. This is a training where if you have experienced past trauma and you're currently sabotaging your romantic relationships or other relationships, I share and show you in the training how you can heal your trauma, rewire your nervous system, and break unhealthy patterns that keep repeating from the past. People have said that they have learned more, understood more, and gotten clearer about their trauma and relationship issues quicker, more effectively, and more deeply than they have in years of therapy. So it is well worth your time if you are struggling and if you've tried other things that have not worked. I will share with you what will help you and what you need to do to finally leave the past in the past and truly be able to let healthy lasting love in. So the website is oritkrug.com slash rewired dash for dash love. That's pretty complicated. So I'm going to leave the link in the show notes right up top so you can sign up for the training. And even if you've done the old version, this is new and revamped. It's not really new, but it's revamped and um, you'll get something really, really valuable out of it, even if you've done it before. Another note is I'm doing a free five day challenge called Come Home to Your Body in my free group, The Lasting Love Movement. This was absolutely incredible. The last time I did it in March, there were so many women who have moved before, who've never moved before, who've hardly been connected to their bodies throughout, throughout their whole lives, starting to connect and move gently through their bodies and share their movement with a group of, oh, I think it was around a thousand people at the time. And I know that sounds really scary, but the way that I've structured this challenge makes it comfortable and safe to come home to your body and be witnessed in it. So we're doing that challenge July 12th to July 16th. It actually doesn't really take much time at all. Um, and there is no certain time requirement. You have to be in the group as long as you do the challenge once a day for those five days. It will probably only take two to five minutes total each day. It's really, really worth your time, I believe. And yeah, it was just the collective energy and movement was absolutely incredible. So join us in the Lasting Love Movement if you want to join the challenge before July 12th. I will also leave that link in the show notes to join the group. And now on to the episode. This is Mind Your Body, a dance movement therapy perspective on the integration of our emotional, cognitive, physical, and spiritual aspects of our being into one more aware and whole existence. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mind Your Body. Today, I have an amazing guest, Grace Bella Harmon. Grace is a registered dance movement therapist. 
And she's been doing this work for three years. And now she specializes in helping people heal grief through their bodies. Um, Grace works with clients online through her amazing sacred grief programs, her sacred grief program and other offerings. And she also works locally in her new home in New Orleans. So um, I'm excited for us to chat with Grace today. Welcome, Grace. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. So why don't we just uh, dive in and let us know what got you specifically into this work around grief? Yeah. Um, so I don't think anyone gets into grief work without their own personal experience of grief. Um, so for me, it was, uh, I think, three months into my master's program in dance movement therapy and counseling, my mom died. And um, that experience of losing her while having this busy life, this like intensive master's program and a regular job and all these other things, um, it really kind of forced me to, to figure out how to live with grief in my body, right? Um, and because of the nature of my loss um, and, you know, everyone experiences grief differently in their bodies. But for me, because it's, it was like such this core loss, it was really overwhelming. Like it was really, really um, hard to function. Um, and I was lucky in that I was in this master's program with these dance therapists who really understood grief and understood the body and understood that like, you know, I wasn't going to be 100. Um, and they let me take, I think, a month off, which is like amazing. Um, but when I got back, I, I remember I was asking a professor and I, and I was like, who had, you know, talked about losing his mom and, you know, kind of had talked about grieving, you know, unrelatedly. And I just asked him, I was like, how do I do this? Like, how do I, how do I live my life and grieve? And he was like, oh, you make grief time. And he just kind of said it in that way. It's like, you have breakfast time and lunch time, you have grief time. And I was like, okay. It's like, yeah, you just have to ritualize it. So that led to a process of me setting aside my own grief time in the morning um, where I just kind of let my body, you know, break open and let myself surrender to my grief as a way of like getting prepared to face the day. Um, and so as I was doing that, I was also going to, I did two different sort of grief groups that were not, uh, embodied grief specifically. One of them was great. One of them was terrible. Um, but neither of them focused on the body really at all. Like they mentioned the body, but I don't think they had the tools to like really bring the body indirectly. And so the whole time I sort of felt like I was cut off at the neck, like my body was experiencing so much, but my uh, grief support was not attending to that. So that led to me doing my thesis on the experiences of body-based practitioners and grief and how that led to a transformation in their spirituality. Um, and then when George Ford was murdered last summer in the summer of 2020, I was inspired to start leading Move Your Grief groups, which was kind of based on the interviews that I did for my thesis. Um, and so that's kind of where it began. And now here I am. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. So why don't we get into more of the uh, talking more about the body. So you had said that you had gotten support for grief but it was it was disembodied it was disconnected and there was so much going on for you in your body that wasn't addressed through this help so I have kind of two questions how did you know how did you know that this grief was in your body and like I want to hear it from a personal perspective but also if you can educate us about how grief is in the body and why it's so important to um, heal it through the body. Totally. So um, 
I guess I'll just say like, there is no way of not knowing that my grief is in my body. Like, like, and even before my mom died, like, as I kind of look back on it, I was like, my body knew, like I was having nightmares. Like I was having trouble sleeping. I was having all of these like embodied experiences that I wasn't ready to like face yet. I wasn't ready to, to listen to that and say, Oh, she's dying, you know? Um, but when it happened, like, you know, I was really lucky in that I grew up in a community that can really kind of hold intense feelings. Um, and so that first week or two, like, you know, we sat Shiva and people were coming in and I was just like in my pajamas the whole week. And I was just given the permission to, um, to just break down whenever I needed to. And I was just, just be like, you know, moaning on the ground and people just, just held that, you know, which was rare. Like most people don't get that experience, I think in this culture or in the dominant white American culture, at least. Um, so I'll just say that there was no way of not knowing that my grief is in my body. And just because of kind of who I am and um, my kind of propensity to listen to my body in general, I, it wasn't hard for me to like start that practice that I talked about of setting aside grief time um, and like kind of really go inward and go deep. And as I started to do that, I, I started to notice that there were specific sensations that were there that were not there before my mom died. So for example, I started to feel this very um, intense, like burning in my back. It was like right, right in the back of my heart chakra, like between my shoulder blades. Um, and I had never felt that before. Mm-hmm. And so I started to, to understand that that was one, my grief. And two, that was like, it felt like a visitation for my mom. Like it felt like, okay, she's here, you know? Um, and so why is that important? Because um, our body experiences grief before any other part of our system catches on, right? Like it's very common after people lose someone to like pick up the phone months or years down the line and and like try to call them. That's because the mind hasn't caught up, Mm. um, for example. But our bodies know, like our bodies experience that right away. Um, But so often we don't, we either aren't equipped ourselves or we don't have a community of support of people who can, one, like encourage us to listen to those things, but two, can hold us while we're like in that really deep sorrow, kind of breaking open time, that early grief time. So um, so because our bodies experience it before anything else, then it's so important to attend to the body as part of the grieving process to kind of let the body guide the process. Um, otherwise the grief gets stuck. It's, it's really, it's really common to try to kind of intellectualize the process. It's common to, um, you know, so much of the cultural narrative, you know, again, in this like dominant white patriarchal capitalistic culture is like, just keep pushing forth, just keep moving through, just keep going. It'll get better with time. Um, you know, your, your person would want you to be sad. Like all the bullshit that people hear um, all encourages like this stuffing down of the grief, the stuffing down of the, the real like gut-wrenching sorrow. Um, I imagine because most people aren't comfortable with feeling that or holding that. Totally, yeah. For themselves um, or for others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and I also think that, you know, a lot of the the sort of narrative that I'm trying to disrupt in my work is this idea that if we let ourselves be in our grief, then we'll break down completely and not be able to get back up. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so much fear around being in that grief. There's so much anxiety about letting ourselves be, feel broken and be broken. Right. Um, but it's actually the opposite. 
that when we set aside intentional time to be in our grief, then we actually become more resilient. Then we can actually feel a much deeper transformation and actually experience our grief as the inroad to other types of healing that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, I hope I answered your question. I think I kind of went on a little, little journey, but. (laughs) Well, what you just said made me think that, you know, there are certain experiences in life that bring up trauma to a point where you can't even deny it. Like if your clients have experienced trauma before even this grief, which is a trauma in itself. Mm -hmm. And this is much like the work that I do with my clients. Um, You know, they have experienced trauma long, long time ago. They've put lots of effort into pushing it down or keeping it away or denying that it's there. And then really commonly with my clients, they give birth, which is extremely embodied or supposed to be embodied experience. I mean, you can't deny your body giving through the process of giving birth and it all comes back. And so I just thought of that and imagine that when you go through this grieving process, it's like you can't deny that this, that very trauma is happening and that it brings up all of this past trauma as well. As you just said, you know, it leads to all this transformation, right? That maybe, maybe they didn't even know they needed or was available to them. Totally. And that happens even with like, you know, people that are quote unquote, very embodied, you know, I struggle a little bit with like, some people are embodied, some people aren't because we all have bodies, but. No, let's talk about this. I want to go here. (laughs) But like, um, I'm thinking about someone that I interviewed for my thesis. So it was, my thesis was an organic um, inquiry process. So I did sort of, so, so I had, I think four people and I did individual um, sort of embodied interviews for each person. And then I did a group interview. Um, and there was one person who was a yoga teacher and, you know, spent a lot of time moving in her body. Um, and her friend had died maybe 10 years ago. And she was like, yeah, you know, I kind of felt like this would be nice, but it wouldn't be like a big deal. And, and, and then when, you know, we were kind of talking about the process at the end, she was like, holy shit. Like, I did not know all of this was here. Um, and I feel so much more connected to my friend. I feel so much more, uh, just aware of my body and grief that I, I didn't, I didn't know it was all still there, you know? which goes to show that like grief, it needs like a constant checking up process. Like even though she had gone through a quite, you know, embodied processing of her own grief right after the loss. Um, it's like, we constantly need to be checking in with our, with our bodies and grief. We constantly need to be going back to that place and just, you know, just taking stock of what's there because it's going to be different over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think this is an important distinction to make because our audience here are mostly body centered healers, whether they're dance therapists or yoga therapists or movement practitioners. And I've seen this as well, where there's, I think embodiment is kind of a trendy thing to talk about and yeah, explore right now. And there's so much there are a lot of embodiment um, experts or leaders or whatever you want to call it, where I see them talking about their practices or trying to help uh, educate others. And I'm like, that's not embodied at all. <laughs> I mean, maybe embodied is the wrong word, but sure. It, it, it in- integrates the body, but it's not, it's not, pr- not in a productive way. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, now I don't know. Like we can get more, I would like to get more into this with you and your grief work, but there was a discussion recently in my group about someone wanting to process anger and how could she do it? Like, Mm. how can you do that? How can she get comfortable with that? And there were a lot of comments that were well-intentioned about um, primal screams and sprinting and, 
you know, just raging. And I was like, no, that's a good temporary release. Maybe, you know, kind of like a drug takes off, you know, takes the edge off. But in the end, it just, it just trains your nervous system to get really have to do this really intense strenuous activity just to collapse, not even to find calm, but to collapse to the yeah. point where it almost tricks you into being calm. Yeah. So I know it. I know in my area of work, that's such a common misconception. And I wonder if you can outline, maybe it's similar. What are the things that, you know, is needed to heal, to truly heal grief in an embodied way? And what are misconceptions? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think one of the misconceptions is with that word heal, that like we never heal, we never like get to an end point of healing our grief. Like we're always sort of healing. Um, You know, it's the difference between like getting through it and like learning to carry it, right? Mm. Um, So I think that's one important thing that like there can be a push to like, do the healing, like go to all the groups, go to therapy. Like I see this a lot in, you know, the grief Facebook groups I'm a part of, like, what can I do to just like feel better? Cause this hurts so much. Right. Um, so one, like never gonna, never going to be healed, always going to be feeling and always going to be carrying it. Never not going to know that we're grieving. Right. Um, the difference is how, how can we integrate the grief into who we are instead of having it be this sort of like extraneous backpack that we carry around. Um, And that takes time. Like it just does. It's not, it's not, um, it's not like, I mean, it's certainly not a quick fix, but it's also going to be different depending on where we are in life. Right. Um, And it's surprising, like it hits us at, you know, unpredictable times. Um, But the more that we, again, can set aside time for our grief every day and learn how to listen to our bodies and set aside time to move towards those uncomfortable sensations, the easier it is to carry because we understand that my grief doesn't fit in a box, your grief doesn't fit in a box. It's not going to, um, not going to move the same way every day. It's not going to feel the same way every day. There might be weeks and weeks and weeks that don't feel much. And then all of a sudden something comes, but what happens when the something comes? What is our response? Is it to push it away? Is it to distract? Is it to, um, you know, try to talk ourselves out of it or is it to listen or is it to pause or is it to attend to that? Right. And neither of those are like all good or all bad, right? There's some times where we need to distract. There's some situations where in that we can't like succumb to that. But if we never set aside time later to succumb to it, then it's just going to get stuck. And it's just going to become this like scary kind of rock that we're sitting with all the time that we, that we never get to explore. Right. So how would you suggest that if you have any concrete, I know you said you had an example, an mm-hmm. idea of a ritual that people can try in their own. Yeah, totally. Yeah, can you share that? So this is something that um, is like foundational to all of the work that I do. Um, and it's make a grief sanctuary. So um, the idea is to set aside a specific place And it can be in your home, it can be in nature, but make sure that it's somewhere where you can go to every day. So if it's outside, really think about, am I gonna go, am I gonna go here? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. So once you've created this space and it can, you know, it can look and feel however you want it to feel. It might have photographs, it might have some flowers or incense or candles, but try to set, if you think about what feels what spaces have I been in that feels sacred how do I want this space to be so kind of imbue it with like some sacred dust whatever that means and looks like to you and then set aside your grief time so the idea is that you come to it around the same time every day for around the same amount of time every day 
And this is going to feel more structured at the beginning. Like it's going to probably feel um, necessary to set a timer just to kind of, you know, have some containment. So you might set it for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, but even 10 minutes can really make a difference. And then when you get to the sanctuary, you sit down or you lie down and you close your eyes and just check in with yourself. Notice where your grief is living in your body. It's going to take some breath, right? It's going to be, it's not going to, it might not come right away, especially if you're not like freshly grieving. But check in with where and how your grief is living in your body. And from there, let yourself move in the way you need to move. So some days that will look like laying on the ground and just breathing. Some days that will look like shaking. Some days that will look like sobbing. Some days that will look like moaning. Some days it'll just look like a prayer. Some days it'll look more like meditation. But it doesn't matter what it looks like as long as you're following your own instincts, right? And again, it's a practice. It's just like any other, you know, practice that you integrate. It's not going to come naturally right away necessarily. But the more that you do it, the easier it will be to one, like carry your grief and two, to live the rest of your life, to be both functional and thriving the rest of your life, to really focus on your relationships, to focus on your work, to not feel like your grief is this like annoying, like voice inside that you're always like shoving down. Once you attend to the voice, once you attend to the grief, once the grief know that there is a, knows that there is a place for it to land, then it's so much easier to live with throughout, throughout mm -hmm. all of your life. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's like the practice that I always give my clients that's foundational to all of the other work. Um, and it's also what I tell like my friends and my family and anyone else because now I'm like, people come to me with grief, all grief things. Um, so that's always the first thing that I encourage people to do. Um, and it doesn't have to, like the sanctuary, you know, it can sometimes that that brings up like sort of really elaborate ornate images, but it doesn't have to be fancy. It can just be like a piece of fabric with a couple photos on it. And that's your sanctuary. It can be in a closet. It can be in a room. It can be in a corner, like whatever, whatever space, you know, you can come back to and will come back to. Is that a calendar invite if you need to? Or not invite, um, alarm, whatever. Um, although I feel like we're really important to, to have a contained intentional space. Mm -hmm. Do, is this something you recommend for anybody and everybody? Like I imagine there's people who might be listening and saying, feeling like that sounds really scary. I don't want to do that. And I think there's a reason why a lot of people have avoided feeling grief in their body. So what do you recommend? Is this something that, is easy it comes, I mean, it's not easy, but um, do you find there's a lot of resistance around it? A lot of stuckness around doing something like this with your clients? Um, I think that it really depends on the person. So one, I'll say like, yes, I do recommend this for everybody, but I also, um, I also really trust in the intuition of each person. So if you know that you're holding a lot and you don't have much support around you right now, I would be gentle. I would set maybe, you know, 10 minutes instead of 40 minutes. Um, it's important to have support. It's important to have, even if it's just one person that you can talk to, that you can process, you know, what, what happened, what, what's happening to you. Um, but I also just want to name that, you know, grief is not a clinical experience and we all do have the intuition within us to, to move in the way that we need to, to process it in the way we need to. And even if it 
you know, even if we feel like our bodies are breaking open, I say, yes, of course it does. Like, of course, why wouldn't it, you know? Um, but, you know, that being said, everyone also knows their own capacity to, I don't know, zip back up to move forward. Um, grief and trauma are different, but if we kind of go to our grief fully and we know we have a lot of trauma, um, then it's important to have support while we do it, right? It's important to be able to parse those things out because, you know, anytime we go to the body, uh, whatever's there will come out. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any example, like client stories or examples of how you've experienced grief, someone moving grief through their body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking of a client who, um, she had both a lot of grief and a lot of trauma. And um, at the time I was working, you know, with an organization with survivors of interpersonal violence. And so everyone that experienced trauma. Um, and it was really fascinating because she, you know, she had all this grief from, you know, many experiences of abuse, as well as just the grief of losing her mom several years ago, but she never named her grief. And I think this is important because it's very easy to, as clinicians, to like, to move, to step aside, to not name the grief directly if there's other things that are in the room, right? Um, but for her, when I, when I named her grief and when I invited her to set aside time to move her grief, like in our sessions together, that ended up opening up so much healing that also needed to, to happen. Um, it really increased her self-esteem, her, her confidence in her body. Um, it made it possible for her to use her voice more clearly. And that was from naming the grief. So do you mean actually verbally naming it or the process of, of acknowledging it and then moving it? Both. Yeah. So for her, the movement, I mean, it looked really different each time, but again, the the thing that I, you know, want to pull out is that the intentionality is, is the difference, right? So once we were able to, once she agreed that she, that she was comfortable, you know, to move her grief, to, to focus on that, then, you know, I would often ring a bell or set a candle or we would do some kind of ritual, something together to open the space. And and then I invited her to just to move her grief while I witnessed. And sometimes that was just lying on the ground for the first few weeks, actually, she just, she just lay on the ground. And then over time, she started to really move in, in much more expressive ways and to actually find her feet on the ground. And I think towards the end of our six months together is when she, um, she was really, like doing a lot of full body movement, which, which she hadn't ever done before. And which was, you know, of course, so parallel to the transformation she had gone through in general. Um, so are you um, in this process, are you witnessing them? Are you moving with them or what does it look like? It's both. Yeah. So, so in my program specifically, um, I do a mix of both guided and not guided movement. I don't want to call it authentic movement because it's not pure authentic movement, but it's based on that, that practice. Um, and in the guided movement, I'm doing it with, with people um, to give you know, them the permission to move in whatever way they need to. Um, and then you know, every session begins with, you know, how is your grief feeling in your body right now? And usually doing some mirroring and checking in with, with them, you know, in an embodied way. Um, and then from there, transitioning to other, other movement and to art making and verbal processing. Yeah. Awesome. Hmm. 
Is there anything else you want to share that's really important to know about moving grief? Um, just that it's not new. Like, you no know, indigenous cultures have always practiced rituals around embodied grief and around that involve singing and moving and um, you know other practices. Um, this is it's like cultures around the world, um, including the U.S. So it's like, you know, maybe because I'm like a white body dancing the therapist, it, and it may sound like fresh and new, but it's not new. It's actually like within all of us in our in all of our ancestral lineages. So, so I think the more that we can set aside time to, to do this to to move our grief in whatever way we need to, um, the more second nature it becomes. Like it's, it, it can feel really scary at the beginning, but the more that we do it, the, the easier it becomes and, um, and the more we can integrate our grief into who we are. I think I always compare it like the beginning grief, it's like we're learning to find our feet, right? Especially if we, it's, it's like a core loss. We, we can't, our bodies have to learn how to move literally without our people. And if we bypass the body in the process and we act that we never give it the chance to learn how to do that. And, and, and most people will suffer, you know, other addiction or, you know, anxiety or depression or anything else that, humans work through um, because of not attending to the grief in the moment. Um, and I also just want to say that it's never too late. Like, even if you, even if you've been dealing with this grief for like five, 10, 15, 20 years, it's never too late to start to move your grief. It's never too late to come back to your body, which, you know, is what my secret grief program is specifically targeting is that kind of older um, unprocessed grief. Right. So you, you work with people who experienced their loss several years ago and help them. Yeah. Yeah. Of course it's never too late because still, if it's still in your body, it's still in your body. It's just like maybe deeper down in there. And yeah. Yeah. So that's really cool that you meet those people I think it, it's more common, especially culturally, to, you know, when, when someone experiences a loss or a huge life change, it's like, that's a time where you're getting lots of texts and calls and are you okay? And how are you doing? And I experienced this as a new mom. And then two weeks later, they start to slow down. You don't hear as much from people. Definitely years after the loss, you know, it's how common is it for someone to even be like, how are you doing without your mom, right? Yeah, I mean, very uncommon. Um, and I think that that can make a lot of people feel crazy. Like, oh, no, I'm still, I still have this. Like, what's wrong with me? I don't feel like myself. I've lost my zest for life. I, I don't feel motivated. I, whatever. Like, what's wrong with me? And it's like, nothing's wrong with you. You just haven't processed your grief. Fully. Yeah. For lots yeah. of good reasons, but it's, but it's never too late, you know. Yeah, you're doing really great work for, the, for especially the forgotten, any of the forgotten people. Yeah. Um, so where can people find you and look up your work and your program and how to work with you or just look up for more resources? Yeah, um, you can go to my website, which is Grace Bella Harmon. Make sure it's M-A-N, not O-N, um, gracebellaharmon.com. I'll put it in the show notes as well. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you can just click on the work with me tab and you'll see sacred grief program. You can learn more there. Um, and it's, it's uh, open as a, both a VIP and a group option. So whatever folks feel would be best for them. Um, and then you can also follow me on Instagram at, at move your grief. Um, I'm also on clubhouse. I hold a move your grief room there on Monday mornings, central time. Um, yeah. So feel free to reach out if you via the contact form on my website if you 
have questions or want to chat or I'd love to hear from you folks. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on this very important and often overlooked topic. So yeah, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing more with us about grief and your story. And um, I am, I hope people follow up with you as you've got a great program and I can just feel through, yeah, they just have a very authentic, genuine um, desire and energy around this. So thanks, Grace.